In the mid-80s, when I was about six years old, if I wanted a home video release devoted to the shorts of my favorite cartoon pig, even though a pantless porcine doesn't wear shorts, this was the best we got. Now, I'm not complaining, mind you. The Warner Brothers cartoon's Golden Jubilee 24 karat collection was itself award-worthy, albeit not for most brevity in a title. But as involved as a VHS series created in 1985 could get, it was by no means as comprehensive and thorough and definitely not as good-looking as Porky Pig 101, a five-DVD set put out by Warner Brothers Archive Collections in 2017. I mean, granted, you don't get this great piece of opening animation with it, something that by that time stood out amidst the lack of quality among the new animation of the day, but this 26-second opening sequence directed and almost entirely animated by Nancy Beeman notwithstanding, if you want a comprehensive home video release devoted to Porky, it would be tough to beat Porky Pig 101. By the way, I have an interview with Greg Ford about that opening piece of animation, and I will be releasing it later on as a quickie, but it actually marks one of the first times Greg worked as a producer for New Looney Tunes Animation. The Golden Jubilee VHS things, which I toiled on on the West Coast. Ah. Anyway, that VHS series was ambitious, but not nearly so much as Porky 101, which unfortunately was not as well received as it should have been. A number of my fellow critics have said that it was a miss, and I'm here to say that they don't know their asses from a rabbit hole in the ground. Or an else hole in the wall. What's up, ducks and ducats? Trevor Thompson, the self-appointed Looney Tunes critic here, and today we're getting all over this DVD set. This is five discs of the first 101 Porky cartoons produced in Schlesinger's, and it is gorgeous. Even the box art is gorgeous, man. So uh, th that's my review. <laughs> Go get it. I love it. I, it's you know a great addition to my collection for sure. Um, and to uh, but there's a, a big story uh, behind getting this thing uh, to you and to me and to all of us who love uh, the, the original black and whites. Uh, so to help us navigate our way through the uh, story in this review, we are joined by a Skype call by Jerry Beck. Ah, greetings, Jerry. Jerry, thank you uh, for taking the time to sit in with me, the self-appointed Looney Tunes critic. Well, the self-important Looney Tunes critic. Jeez. I do like to yammer on, um, but thank you for gracing us with your presence as the self-appointed Looney Tunes historian that you are. Well, anybody can be a self-appointed Looney Tunes historian. If you're self-appointing, you can also be a self-appointed Fleischer historian or a Disney historian. Yeah. See that, Mr. Copperman? There's hope for you yet. Eras coming. This DVD set is so cool, you guys. In a world where binge-watching is not only a thing, but a thriving thing, Porky Pig 101 is a relic from the past that is perfect for binging and, more importantly, holds up well today. Oof. Well, for the most part, anyway. So today, join me and my guest Jerry Beck in examining the process of getting to and the hopeful future of Porky Pig 101. As I mentioned in the intro, this thing came out in 2017 but production began as early as 2012, so it took about five years to compile and release. And yet, something I didn't realize until I made the review for this thing is that none of the cartoons on this set were restored specifically for it. I think I assumed they would be, at least some of them, as it's the sort of thing they do when they specifically target DVD sets for collectors. But we'll get into that more later. Another reason I may have thought they'd restore these old porkies for this release is that the look of the cartoons range from really good to great and the combination of seeing these previously unreleased cartoons, sometimes right alongside ones that were restored for earlier releases, is enough to allow one to assume, albeit incorrectly, that exclusive restorations had been done for the set. So, if it's just putting cartoons out that have been in the vault all this time, why would it take five years? A very good question, voiceover me. Thanks, straight to camera me. I thought it was. You were right, and I'm welcome. But alas, the question remains, why so long? And the person I ask, really, why so long, would be you, Jerry. 
I mean, the assumption is that Warner Brothers just handed you the keys to their vault and assigned you 10 or 12 underlings to pull any and all titles that you wanted. So with this vast library of titles and this expensive Burbank studio and all this stuff at their fingertips, a Burbank studio, by the way, that was now putting out more themed releases with its Warner Archive collection. What was the holdup? The main reason, if I had to sum it up in two words, would be red tape. Um, the, I was working with Warners, uh, all through the last decade on, uh, Looney Tunes, golden collections, um, DVD sales were slowly going down. Um, uh, and you know, that's why we had to stop doing the golden collections after number six. So, you know, the fans don't understand that it costs a fortune to do these things. And you've got to understand one, this is extremely important that, Although they are Warner Brothers, and although they own Superman, and DC, and Harry Potter, and whatever other franchises that they own, and they make billions and billions of dollars worldwide and all these things, each department is run as a separate little business. Which should explain definitively to my viewers why it doesn't make sense to think of bad sales of a single DVD set as the responsibility of an entire studio. Which is why if a certain set doesn't do well, it actually does hurt the chances of another one like it coming out in future. It affects that little business. People, one of the complaints I hear a lot of times is that, well, Warner Brothers got a ton of money. They can do it. They're not Steve Stanfield. They got the, 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 here's the thing. They run that department like it's its own little business, which it is. And if that department puts out a product and spends millions of dollars on it, and then they don't make that money back or a profit, well, they're going to go out of business. And so they weigh everything they put out very, very, very carefully. And it has to be figured out uh, in how to produce it. And then number five came around. I remember them telling me that's this is going to be the last one. And we already were working on number six. And we had other we had bonus things ready. We had all sorts of stuff ready to go. And. We basically spent a few months, then five comes out, we spent a few months begging, begging the department that A, because we had a lot of the bonus stuff already done, and because we had a lot of stuff kind of in the can, that all we needed was another 50% of what we would, we could produce this six set for 50% of what, what the previous sets cost, because we literally could. And I rearranged stuff, and we jam. I jammed in some black and white cartoons and wartime cartoons that I really wanted to have out. Um, so the six set, I don't know what it looks like to anybody else, but I, I, I look at it. I, I can see that how I jammed stuff from set seven, eight, nine, ten. 10, you know, that I wanted to make sure we're in here. And, um, and then it was sad because we couldn't put out the rest of them that we had in our head. Six was going to be it. So six was going to be it, as you say. And they basically didn't, produce any other Looney Tunes DVDs after that, right? I mean, with some exceptions, very rare. And they were stuff that could be put out really, really cheap. For example, uh, uh, the Tom and Jerry Gene Deitch collection. You know what I mean? That was just stuff that was sitting there and we could do that. But my point is we were, we had come to an end of that little golden age of putting out that kind of material. Meanwhile, George Feltenstein, the exec major exec at, uh, at, at Warner Home Video, uh, came up with a new idea to appease fans and also to see if there was a way that, he, that they could make some money with library product. Of course, I would, we're friends, and I would always say, well, we got to do something with the old cartoons. What can we do? How can we do it? There was literally nothing we can do because we had no money, no budget to restore uh, any films. There was nothing. Um, George... And I, we, we came up with a lot of ideas. We finally had, we had one idea that we couldn't let go, and it was the black and white porkies. Um, and George is the one that we, we counted how many there were, and there was like 99 black and white porkies. And we said, well, we got to have you, you, you know, uh, um, I haven't got a hat. We have to have that. We have to have old glory. I felt like we had to have those two in there. So that made it 101. And the idea of calling it Porky Pig 101 was great because it sounded like a class you'd teach in college on Porky Pig. And uh, plus, we had to go through clearances. That was one of the holdups. That was something that was at least a year or two, believe it or not, on this concept, was clearing with their legal department uh, the cartoons 
um, they fell under the corporate mindset that cartoons are for kids. And if it's a cartoon, it belongs to the what they call the family unit. The family unit in, that puts out, I don't even know what they put out. They put out these stuff that's aimed at children and parents for Warner Brothers. Um, so one of the things we had to do is to convince the family group to let us have these black and white porkies because this is kind of obvious. They will never put them out. Uh, they, they held everything because, well, we may put them out. No, no, no. You're never going to put out black and white porky pig cartoons to the family audience. Why would you? And eventually they understood that. And they eventually gave us the permission to put those out under the archive collection. So then there was the issue of how are we going to do this in terms of we knew we had X number of them already remastered that were on the golden collection. So we knew we'd just shunt those over. And we'd also move over the, the, the same uh, uh, audio commentaries from that. Again, we had no money to do new ones. Um, hey, Beck, there's no excuse for that one. My boy Trevor does Looney Tunes commentaries every Saturday morning for free. And they're worth every penny, too. He's crude, but he's got a point, Jerry. I mean, in future, if you need a free DVD commentary, I'm your guy. Cheap's my middle name. <laughs> I'll buy that for a dollar. You'd buy a nickel for a dollar, stupid. Shut up. Sorry, Jerry. Um, you were talking about the lack of funds, although lack of nickels and dollars. <laughs> um, the thinking was, instead of going back to the original negatives, we went into the vault, the vault prints, uh, the, the ones that were sitting in the vault. Now you're thinking, I know a lot of people out there are going, they ran a more complete version on Nickelodeon, and that's because those were taken from the original negative. Well, why didn't you use those masters? Okay, okay, because those masters weren't set up for uh, today's television sets. So for today's, you know, uh, the, the, the I'm not good at the technical stuff. But yeah, well, basically, um, I think I can explain it for the YouTube generation, and certainly to people who made the "it looked better on Nickelodeon in the '90s" argument that you were talking about, and. Uh, to the for the stuff that I can't explain simply, I leave in the capable hands of my mouse assistant. Me? Why me? I'm with Jerry. I don't know anything about that technical crap. Of course not, you cottonhead. I mean your brother. Where's Iggy? Get him out here so we can explain this stuff. All right, I'm on it. Uh, let me just get him a call here. Hey, what are you doing? Don't call him now. We're right in the middle of a. What is it, oh dearest and onlyest of brothers? What's up, Brainiac? The boss needs you down here at the studio, pronto. How soon can you get here? Well, if I leave right this second, considering what traffic is like, and that is to say, I don't know what traffic is like, so I can't consider it, but to be considered... in time, I could see Except that I'm not worried about any point in time, excepting, of course, that that any point in time... You know what? This could uh, take a little while to figure out. So, um, in the meantime, one of you guys watch this. It'll it'll make uh, what we're about to discuss a little bit easier to follow. <laughs> we all know what HD TV is, right? High definition television. And chances are, you probably have at least one monitor in your home that qualifies as an HD television. But what does that really mean on a technical level? Well, if TV now is HD, that means you get a sharper image. But how? More information, more definition, high definition to be exact. The more dense an image, the more definition it has. And it's easier to see those images on a larger monitor. So let's talk about that information, that extra definition. Your monitor doesn't add it to existing images. It's just that it's able to handle HD images, whereas older televisions might not. So if it's high definition, obviously that means there's a lower definition. Well, there is and it's called standard definition. And this is what television was until the early 2000s, standard definition. So now, having established the world of today with the world of yesterday as high def and standard def, here now is Iggy, categorized as a lab mouse simply because he's a mouse with his own lab, to translate it to you, the YouTube audience. Remember, this is the reason why you can't simply take a broadcast master tape from the late 80s, bump it up to HD, and expect the quality to be acceptable. Iggy. Yes. Oh, hello, fans. Dr. Ignatius A. Mouse here. And today, we're going to be looking at lines of resolution. 
If you look closely at a film strip, you see individual pictures in each frame. And these pass by a light. 24 of them a second, you know. For video, the individual pictures aren't called frames, but rather fields. When film is projected on a wall, you're looking at frames, Jack. But when you're watching a film on a DVD player or a VCR, you're watching fields. All video is made up of scan lines, which do the job of the light shining through the frames of film. These scan lines, or resolution lines, are used to see these fields, and in standard definition broadcasting, the number of scan lines is 480, which was what we were watching in the 80s and 90s. 480 glorious, odd and even lines of resolution. It was an idyllic time, to be sure. I don't know what idyllic means, but it certainly was a good time in the 80s. That's when I met my girlfriend. You met her in the 20s, and she's not your girlfriend. Ah, can you say? We're in love. We are in love. Perhaps, but not with each other. Thanks. You been holding out on me? You got a girl? No. What's her name? Well, what does this have to do with video and scan lines? Or, or for that matter, what does Twinkle Belly have to do with Porky Pig? No, pants. She doesn't wear pants, of course. Yeah, I heard it and I said it. It's obvious. Anyway, the... When did you get here, dude? What is a kitty cat doing here? Anyway, the main thing that's different about a field in video and a frame in film is that up until the early 2000s, scan lines were interlaced, which meant that individual fields didn't have full pictures. One field has the odd-numbered scan lines, the one after it has the even. This means that in video, you're not seeing the full picture in each field, whereas if it was film, you would be seeing a full picture in every frame. That is, of course, before the days of 2006 and on. The days of progressive scan. Progressive scan was the process that replaced interlaced lines when televisions went HD, back in the early 2000s. Rather than getting half a picture on every field, you were getting a full one now, which was needed for the larger, more dense imagery of HD video. Which is now, ironically, the standard. Standard depth. This is not ironic, you are an idiot, and it is not the standard. 4K is the standard now. We're actually technically old school at this point. Anyway, now that we're down here, this little gear area is probably the best way to explain it to the YouTube crowd. By clicking that little gear, you can see that one of the options is quality. 480p is almost always on there. What is unfortunately always not on there is an improvement of content quality. Doesn't matter which one you select, the videos of minty comedic arts will always be boring. So if you click the gear and there are the levels of quality but not one for minty because he is amazing, his videos are beyond measure, and he is a friend so shut up! The 480, as you know, means standard def, but the P stands for progressive scan. Progressive scan has been the standard now for so long that today, you have to go out of your way to shoot and upload interlaced video because most websites and video equipment automatically convert it to progressive with results that are often, frankly, only satisfactory. This is also why some cartoons have a slightly blurry look to them, as seen most prominently in the outlines. If you're looking at a restoration that came from the negative, Everything looks great. But if the cartoon is just a transfer from a broadcast master tape made pre-2005, the interlaced lines get the progressive scan treatment, and the result is a blurriness that is most present in the black lines that surround the characters. This happens when the source used was made for broadcast, and the result is a slightly out-of-focus feel due to the odd and even lines of resolution not being put back in place perfectly, which, by the way, is impossible. Correct. As the saying goes, you can't unscramble eggs. Yeah, and it's always more difficult and expensive to use film prints or the negatives, which is why they use tape. And if you want an example of just how bad it can get, take a look at any of the DVD releases of Warner Brothers stuff from the Silver Age. Tiny Toons, Animaniacs, Taz, all of it. It's either still interlaced, or it's been hastily converted with progressive scan, and that's because none of those DVD releases used the film negatives, more than likely because prints and negatives for TV shows are rarely kept at all. That being said, the new Blu-rays for Batman the Animated Series look amazing. Because they got the negatives. But in most cases, including earlier releases of Batman, the DVDs for most animated shows made before the days of digital ink and paint are sourced from broadcast dupe tapes. However, the DVD set for Mighty Mouse The New Adventures is that rare example. Like the Batman Blu-rays, it too was transferred from the negative. 
thanks to Jerry, who reached out to our mutual friend and fellow LTC interviewee, Tom Minton, who knew how to find the original camera negative. And as you can see, it was well worth the trouble. Yes, it's Bat-Bat, masked defender of justice. Bat-Bat has dedicated his life to wiping out corruption and filth in this diseased society of ours. With the help of his faithful sidekick, the Bug Wonder. Anyway, speaking of Jerry, we need to get back to him. So, Iggy, sum this all up. They used Jerry's vault prints instead of the broadcast masters made from the original negative because there wasn't enough money to make restorations or strike new prints from the negatives. They couldn't even afford a one light pass, goodness Christ. So they used vault prints, 35 millimeter prints. And the reason they used the prints instead of the master broadcast tape is because, why? You always use film over tape, duh! It is a far, far, far superior format. So much so that with the advent of 4K, we are only now at the point in our technological acumen where video is able to handle the weight of photography on the level that film does without any degradation to the original photographed image whatsoever. And even then, thank you, Iggy, 480 is the size of the cartoons on this set but they convert to Blu-ray beautifully, as anyone who has seen the clips in this review or any of the commentaries of the cartoons from this set that I've done will note. If you're watching this review in HD right now, you can see that these cartoons look good in HD, and that's because instead of using old interlaced tapes, they used solid film prints and converted them in progressive scan. Now, 480 is a small size by today's standards, but back in the 80s and 90s, it was as big as you could go. But a small picture taken on an HD camera looks good when you resize it. Not so if you resize a picture from an old digital camera. So basically, if you've ever lost your original digital pictures and gone back to a MySpace profile and resized them only for them to turn out blurry, that's essentially what would happen if they used the old broadcast master dupes, right, Jerry? Right. You're absolutely right. That is, and that was the issue. That's why we couldn't use those, those those transfers that were done for the, in 1990, you know, were not going to work on, on your television today. So we had to do some new transfers. We even looked at the negatives. Uh, I mean, we did a lot of things to, because we wanted to, you know, as be as complete as we possibly could. Speaking of complete, uh, there's a very completist feel to this set. And uh, when I was watching all of these, these cartoons, all five discs in a row, something very interesting happened. Um, I got to see the evolution of the studio in terms of its technical abilities, storytelling, comic timing. And uh, I couldn't help but wonder as I was watching this all in order, I was thinking, is that this effect, it's very prominent. And a lot of people have reported having that same feeling and, and noticing that. So was this effect intentional when you decided to put these out or just a happy accident? It was a happy accident. And in fact, to tell you the truth, um, you got to understand when I've done my books, uh, my previous guide and all that, we never watched them in order. We watched them way out of order. You know, we just watched them, you know, as come, come as may. Um, it wasn't until we had the first check discs of this set, which was before it came out. Um, and, and there was one weekend, I think it was the first weekend I got it where I, what I did was I spent all weekend running each disc, you know, in order when I had time to watch them. But it became a, but like you're saying, that experience um, came over me watching them that way. I said, I never, I realized myself, I never watched them in order before. This is really cool. I could see, you could see the Tex Avery style develop. You can see, you know, the, the artwork get better. You can see, you know, clamp it, become clamp it. You know, it was just, it was a revelation to me. And it was another reason why it was more, it became almost like a cause now that we had to get this out. Uh, we don't have the budgets that we had 10 years ago, but, uh, but we have some new techniques uh, that we're working with our, the technical people um, and to uh, enable to, us to put out, all I can say is the Pop, a Popeye volume one, the 1940s, um, is an example of what we now know we can do. And, uh, okay, you know, so that's all I can say about the future. But I will say that there's some really good ideas coming up, and you'll, you'll all be interested as we... Yeah, 2020 is definitely going to be a great year for all things Looney Tunes. And, of course, all things, well, you know, it's a great year. It's going to be a great year for us fans. 
Because next uh, next year, 2020, is going to be, among other things, Bugs Bunny's 80th birthday. And I was a kid when, in 1990, I was like 10, I think, or 10 or 12, something, but certainly not 11. Absolutely not. Uh, but I was, you know, I was around for the 50th birthday. Um, and that was a great time to be alive as a Looney Tunes fan. So I'm telling you, that alone would make next year awesome. But we also got the Looney Tunes cartoons coming out in May on the HBO Max streaming service. We may even see Space Jam 2 next year. So, but I do want to get back to uh, this wonderful set here. And um, as I'm looking at it, here, get a look at that. That is gorgeous. That cover is gorgeous. And, you know, the, the, the artwork there is gorgeous. The menu artwork is gorgeous. And the reason it's all gorgeous is because it's original artwork. This isn't like they're not going into stock, um, you know, stock uh, animation, you know, from, you know, not animation, but stock drawings for marketing. They're not doing any of that. This is all stuff that was presumably screen used. And even if it isn't, you can tell it's drawn by Bob Clampett or Robert McKimson or somebody who was working at Schlesinger's. Um, so basically what I'm asking is, since this is clearly something we've never seen before, hence the bane of every Warner Brothers executive's existence, why don't you, I'm sure it wasn't easy, Jerry, so why don't you uh, tell us that story? How'd you get that artwork approved? Oh, I, lo I love that you asked that question because that was one of my favorite little moments. And um, the original thought was it's classic. We want people to get the idea that it's classic old cartoons. We're not doing something that looks like with an airbrushed image that, that's for sale at Walmart. We're doing something that's really for the collectors. And, you know, I forgot what happened. George, for some reason, I forgot. what happened. We, we, we bandied around a few ideas and we were talking about it. And I said, you know, it would be perfect would be what you see this idea of Porky bursting out of the, the drum or the package. And then I said, wait a minute, Ruth Clampett, Bob's daughter, uh, started literally 20 years ago, a, uh, uh, an animation cell limited edition business. And the first one they did was this was Porky coming out of the thing. And I remembered that I took it, I flipped it to black and white. I mocked this cover up. And then she said, well, we need a high res of this. And I, I know Ruth Clampett. She's a friend. We called her up. I had George contact her officially through Warner Brothers. And they licensed the image from her officially. She was delighted because it was her dad's Porky to be on the cover. And, um, uh, and, and, and that's how the, the, that, that image, she gave them a high res of that and, and flipped in black and white. And, uh, and I'm really, I was very, very pleased with, uh, with that coming out that way. So that's, thank you. You're very welcome. And a major thanks should also go to Ruth and her brother, Rob, the Clampett family historian, both of whom helped clarify some of the information in this review. So if you want your own copy of the cell used for the Porky 101 cover or any of the other amazing art you see here, go to ClampettStudio.com and tell them the Looney Tunes critic sent you. You won't get any kind of a discount or anything. This isn't like a promotion, but it's just that Ruth was very sweet and she and Rob were very generous with their time when they didn't have to be. So I thought I would return the favor and mention the cell business. So it's not a commercial. But speaking of. After these messages, we'll be right back. Earth calling Manx. Earth calling Manx. You have the intel we requested. Over. Yeah, Roger Rabbit. That's a copy. Over. Earth calling Manx. Please relay that intel. Over. Roger Ramjet on that one, Oi. <laughs> well, the best source on YouTube for Looney Tunes and Merry Melodies info is the Looney Tunes critic. We all know that. But sometimes people like you want a little more comprehensive coverage. So that's why Ferris Wheelhouse, our mothership, has created the LTC blog at LooneyCritic.com. It's a great way to peek behind the scenes, get updates on upcoming videos, and read articles, interviews, and blog posts about Looney Tunes history, as well as current projects, such as the new Looney Tunes cartoons. And you can also learn about viewing parties, live appearances, and ways to get Looney Tunes critic merch. Oh, so woo. And if you click on my face, you'll be rewarded for your curiosity. 
by the way, the thing about clicking on my face, it's only available on the desktop version of this site. You kids with your mobile devices, <laughs> no treat for you. But yeah, that's basically it for this commercial. The LTC blog, now live at looneycritic.com, and soon to be dead everywhere else. <laughs> and if you're trying to click the screen right now, you're a dumbbell. Links in the description, jackass. We now return to the Bugs Bunny and Tweety Show. Porky Pig 101 is a great set, but if you ask some of its detractors, they would tell you a skunk would stink less. There are a number of common complaints, but many of them stem from the fact that the only restorations on this set were ones that had appeared on previous DVD sets. Now, if you feel gypped about this, then it's obvious you're only thinking of things from your own perspective and what you know, which is fine, I guess that's how most people think of things, but take a different approach, okay? Think about it not as an animation fan, but as a corporate studio who needs to make a profit every year in order to continue to be viable. Remember, Warner Brothers is not a group of super rich animation fans that just have the keys to a vault full of everything in perfect condition and we're all just sitting around awaiting their whims. No, it's a corporation. People sometimes think of it as the studio going, you know, take this, we're the adults, take what we give you. And That's what they did you, to me when I was a kid. We got, we got horrible dupe prints with retitles on them, with, with uh, TV titles, colorized. All we could do was accept what was given to us on our local television station. You know, I'm trying to make the world a better place than that. I'm trying to put the jigsaw puzzle back together again. Or unscramble those eggs. I will say that the negative reviews hurt sales, and that hurt progress on getting this kind of material out. If this thing had failed because the fans who think they know better kill it, um, you know, because it's not exactly the way you think it should be. Um, there's a bigger picture here. Yeah, that's it. That's absolutely it. There's a bigger picture to be considered here. Thank you, Jerry. And that really is the danger in listening to the loudest voice in a fandom. It hurts that bigger picture that Jerry's talking about. It assumes two things, albeit for the most part incorrectly. One, that that voice even speaks for everyone in the fandom. And two, that they even know what they're talking about. But we spent the majority of this review showing you guys how for a DVD set with pretty much no budget because of declining DVD sales in the past, which by the way, we are partially responsible for, this set is gorgeous, fit for the future, and made from some of the best materials available on hand, considering, once again, no budget. And we also learned that if certain members of this fan community had had their way, we'd have gotten an inferior product. But speaking of negative and irrational criticisms, take a gander at this. This is a petition to get Warners to redo the set with certain title changes. This is exactly what the fuck I'm talking about! Guys, if you want the studio to take you seriously, you've got to stop making demands that are beyond their control, or, more to the point, demands that actually fucking matter! For those that might be unaware, congratulations on knowing what sex feels like. There has been, for several decades now, a very loud continuing complaint in the Looney Tunes fandom about the late 40s, early 50s Blue Ribbon series, and also the fact that several cartoons made before 1948 have had their opening titles altered in various ways. Now, while I can't in good conscience say that this was completely unavoidable or that Warner Brothers is completely blame-free in every example, complaining about the Blue Ribbon series is even dumber than Warner's axing the original titles in the first place! The Blue Ribbon series are essentially reissues of older cartoons with the opening credits cut out and replaced with a single title card. These reissues started happening during the Golden Age, and if the original prints that had those titles were thrown away then, there's no going back. So to complain about a restored cartoon like, say, Old Glory that has a Blue Ribbon title card is really and truly missing the point. You wouldn't have a restored copy of Old Glory were it not for the Blue Ribbon version. And if they had recreated them, 
Every one of these anal retentive complainers would have had their say about how it's not perfect. Which, if you have to recreate something, it's not going to be perfect, so way to make a moot point, you theoretical basement-dwelling dipshits. Now, the other thing to consider, and I've been saying this since I was six, but the myriad ways in which it applies here is quite astonishing. Here's the headline. Warner Brothers is not Disney. That's right, folks. Warner Brothers isn't Disney. At least not yet. Warner Brothers didn't build its legacy on its cartoon characters and animated films. And the head of the studio wasn't an animator who valued his chosen craft. So it shouldn't be too big of a leap to make the connection that while Disney does have the negatives of most of its animated catalog in their vaults, Warner Brothers, who truly were making those shorts to have a life expectancy of maybe seven years max, don't have all of those materials on hand. In fact, the God's honest truth is that it is amazing that we were able to get the restorations we got thus far. So, back to this silly petition, which, by the way, comes up on the first page of a Google search for Porky Pig 101 review. I'm actually quite happy to see that in the year plus that it's been online, it's only gotten 17 of its proposed thousand signatures. But that it comes up on the first page of a search is, frankly, upsetting. At any rate, it serves as a microcosm. Now, the idea that Warner Brothers would reissue a DVD simply for the sake of a few individual titles is almost as silly and outside the realm of reality as the idea that all it would take to achieve this goal is a thousand signatures. This could be seen as more proof of what I've always suspected, but that Warner Brothers needs to see, which is some of the Looney Tune fandom's loudest complainers are by no means the majority. And to that loud minority, I say this, if you guys aren't careful, your obsession with Warner Brothers getting the minutia of these cartoons fixed to your OCD influence level of satisfaction is going to get us all in trouble. The first thing we as a group need to do, stop complaining about the fucking title cards! I appreciate the completest mindset. I do. But complaining about something that is impossible to fix just paints us all as a group of compulsives that will never be happy. And what do you do with someone in your life who you regard as never being happy? Right. You stop trying to make them happy. You give up. Mother wasn't home. We as fans need a healthy dose of self-awareness because when we take to the internet, complaining about little details that we think could be fixed, despite not having done any research, we come off as a large body of people who will never be satisfied, hence driving Warner Brothers to conclude, why bother? In fact, when dealing with us, it's a wonder that Warner Brothers doesn't change its name to Why Bother Pictures. And hey, if you need proof that what Jerry and I are saying is true, that we really do need to be less nitpicky because there's a long game that has to be played with the studios, there's a positive example to be gleaned. The Popeye Blu-rays. The Popeye sets are gorgeous. They're already on their third volume, and more from the vault is on the way. And you want to know why? It ain't because the restorations are completely flawless. It's because everyone bought them, and they didn't nitpick the flaws to death. The problem with these nitpickers is that they think of themselves as perfectionists. Well, apparently they've never met me. You don't know me very well, do we? Hi, I'm Trevor Thompson, the self-appointed Looney Tunes critic. And none of you are more of a Looney Tunes perfectionist than me. Here's why I say that. I own physical and digital copies of every Looney Tunes special movie and cartoon, multiple versions, constantly updating them, and even, as you saw earlier, obtaining rare collector's versions, or in some cases, making my own quote-unquote restorations to get around watermarks of cartoons that never had any official release. I have multiple copies of all the books you could own on the Looney Tunes history, and to be quite frank, in most cases, I've forgotten more than most people even know about Looney Tunes Merry Melodies, and it's only when I talk to those in the industry and or know, like Jerry, that I learn anything new anymore. So I'm constantly networking with people in animation and cartoon history in an effort to learn more and share it with everyone. For me, the best versions of the cartoons available aren't always the best. And the information available isn't always accurate. So in both cases, I seek out my own. That being said, you will never, ever 
see me on some message board complaining or on some petition trying to get new circles, new colorings, or the, the right intro music on a different print, or complaining that this DVD release, this cartoon on this DVD release, doesn't look as good as my VHS copy of it on the Bugs Bunny and Tweety show. And you know why you'll never see me doing anything like that? Because then I wouldn't be a perfectionist. I'd be a nitpicker. And nobody wants to fuck those guys. Seriously, it's ill-advised. Even the Surgeon General says so. That's the difference, kids. I'm 41. I've been studying Looney Tunes Merry Melody since I was six. I'm telling you guys, enough is enough. 2020 is the premiere of the new Looney Tunes cartoons. It's going to be Bugs Bunny's 80th birthday. We may even see Space Jam 2 that year. It's going to be a huge year for all things Looney Tunes. We cannot mess this up. I want you all on your best behavior, or so help me, I will turn this fandom right around and we'll go home. The point is, I've been around for a while, and I can tell you from experience, as can Jerry, the years when Looney Tunes are big are few and far between. In fact, it's been 50 years since Warner Brothers has even attempted to make these cartoons the right way. So if ever there was a time for us as a collective fandom to curb the louder and more irresponsible complainers among us and not bite the hand that feeds, it's right now, okay? Time to put the adult back in adult collector. Folks, that's gonna do it for this review of Porky Pig 101. I'm uh, Trevor Thompson, the self-appointed Looney Tunes critic, and I wanna thank my guest once again, the uh, self-appointed Looney Tunes historian, Jerry Beck for sanctioning my buffoonery and that of uh, Manx and Iggy and everyone else, so. That's all, folks. <laughs>